it already. What's the first commandment? The first commandment is to love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. In fact, can anyone recite all 10 commandments? I'm not going to make you do it. Yeah, but the other day I asked you that and you missed one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now he's going to do it. <laughs> if you look carefully at the Ten Commandments, the reason why when, when, Nick, when, the, when the rabbis came to Jesus and they were asking him about this and, and, the, and he's explaining them to them, here's what the first commandment is, and he jumps on to the second one, and the rabbi at the end of that says, you know, wow, you got it right. You have just summarized the whole law in that statement. It's because the first four commandments are all about our relationship with God. We're supposed to love God. We're supposed to worship Him. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It's all about honoring Him, not take His name in vain. The second six commandments, if you look at them carefully, are all about our relationships with one another. We're not supposed to covet. We're not supposed to steal. We're not supposed to commit adultery. We're not supposed to bear false witness. All those things, they relate to our relationship with one another. And that's why when Jesus is asked, you know, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. So today as we begin our focus on what does it mean to put legs to, our, to faith? It's a slogan that the, the church came up with um, just over 10 years ago. And, and it's the mission statement for the church that we're putting legs to faith, loving God, encouraging one another, growing as Christ's disciples, and sharing Jesus. Does anybody know where you can find that mission statement? It's in the bulletin every Sunday, isn't it? We used to have a, a verse over here. It was from 1 John 3, 1. I asked one Sunday, can anybody tell me what 1 John 3, 1 says? The whole church sat here just stumped. No one could remember what 1 John 3, 1 said. And then I simply turned over here and said, interesting, it's been on the wall there for how long? And, it, and it's, it's sad how the familiar can become forgotten. How that which has been really special to you becomes mundane. This especially can happen in a relationship particularly in the marriage relationship. Now, I know a lot of you aren't married sitting here this morning, and I understand that some, some of you maybe don't want to be married. Maybe you've been married and <laughs> had some issues with it. Um, and, or maybe you're still looking at marriage and considering that possibility. Or maybe the person that you've loved is already with Jesus. And so you're at all, we're at all different places as a congregation with marriage. But, but for those of you who have been married, I want you to think about it. it Think about what it was like when you first dated. Most of us in America did not have an arranged marriage, right? Now, there's other places where you can still have an arranged marriage, and somebody simply tells you, okay, the two of you are going to marry each other. I had never met him, though. Oh, well, too bad. You'll learn to love him. What if I don't like her? You'll learn to like her. Arranged marriage, okay? In America, we don't have that, do we? Not for most of us. Most of us get the privilege of choosing somebody. Uh, and we spend some time dating them, right? Getting to know them. And this morning we're going to be reminded of the fact that that love is something that we can forsake and we need to remember what it was like when we first loved someone and go back and do those things we did at first. How many of you dated before you got married? Mm -hmm. How many of you enjoyed that dating? Yeah? So the real test is, how many of you are still dating? Because if you're not, romance is going to die. Love is going to grow cold. The, re <laughs> excuse me, the relationship is going to be sick, unhealthy, in trouble, unless you continue to do the things you did at first. Amen? And not just for the first year. Congratulations, by the way, again. <laughs> Dylan was incredibly intelligent when he proposed and told Alicia that he wanted to marry her on January 1st. He will never forget when they got married. <laughs> <laughs> I know he did that because he was afraid she would forget. <laughs> It's 
Seriously. As we talk about what it means to love God, and that's, that's the first tenet of our mission statement, everything begins there with loving God and loving each other. Let's look at Revelation chapter 2. Jesus is uh, looking at the churches of Asia, of Asia Minor, and the first one he's going to look at is the church known as Ephesus. If you've read the letter uh, that Paul wrote to Ephesus, Ephesus was a pretty special place, a place and, and people that Paul really loved, had a great relationship with them. E Ephesus, he prays for them to even grow in their knowledge of love because they've had such this spe a special relationship. They've been great servants of the Lord. God's done wonderful things through the church of, of, of Ephesus. But now Jesus, here at the end of uh, John's life, John's out at the island of Patmos, John's probably sometime around 95 AD, something like that, and John is writing the final, his final instructions, and he's had this vision from God, and as a part of that vision, it opens up with this prescription, if you will, this um, doctor looking at his, the health of his churches, and here's how Revelation 2 begins, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. As you listen to what Jesus is saying there about the church of Ephesus, I mean, he's really praising the church, isn't he? Look, you haven't grown weary. Things have gotten really bad for you, very difficult, very hard for you. You are great servants. You've done all kinds of things. I know your deeds. You're working hard. You're persevering. You're staying at it. And you don't tolerate wicked people who claim to be apostles but are not, who have tried to speak falsely to you. You understand the difference between truth and non-truth. You know that Jesus rose from the dead and that he's coming again. And you understand these truths and so you haven't given in to these false teachers. And, and, and you, if you were there in Ephesus at the moment and, and Jesus had said this to the church, if Jesus had come to the front of the church of Ephesus and said these things, you all would be standing there like, wow, aren't we part of a wonderful church? And then there's that little word. It starts verse 4. In my version, it says, yet. Some versions probably, but. Yet, uh-oh, I hold this against you. I have all these great things I've seen in you, church, uh, and, I, and, and I really appreciate what you've been doing. But church, as I look at you, there's something very serious and very unhealthy. I hold this against you. You have forsaken you have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now you do have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. But friends, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. If you listen, if you re come back to Jesus, if you repent, if you do the things you did at first, if you understand how far you've fallen and you do something about it, guess what? Eternal life is waiting for you. The tree of life that has been separated since the Garden of Eden and the fall of man, that, that tree you get to eat from again and you get to live eternally. I know your deeds. I know all this about you. Yet I hold this against you. You left your first love. You've left your first love. You've forsaken the one that you loved at the beginning. And here's, friends, I need you to think about this for a minute. Every marriage is vulnerable to adultery. Every single one. And, and, and I would hope you would be one that would say, no, 
I'm not going to allow that to happen. Praise God. But everyone is vulnerable. And it's vulnerable at this point because people make conscious choices. Every affair, every single one, has occurred because somebody started making conscious choices to move away from their spouse towards someone else. It was a conscious act. Oh, it may have started because, well, she's just attractive, you know, it's just kind of neat to see somebody attractive. He's just, he's just wise. I, I just like listening to him and his counsel. I, you know, I enjoy working with him. She's such a hard worker. I've just been impressed with her. And, and it's, it's a conscious choice to start recognizing somebody else and you start to value that person and then you start to do what? Then you start to look for opportunities to connect with that person. Oh, look, he's at the coffee. I think I'll go have a cup of coffee too. Oh, oh, th some of you are going out for lunch. To yeah, I'll be glad to go out to lunch. And, now you, and, you, and you just happen to sit next to her. Every affair happens because of a conscious choice and multiple conscious choices that are made. And what's Jesus saying here? You've left your first love. You've made a conscious choice to leave the person that you loved from the beginning. The, the, the Ephesian church has lost their focus. They've taken their eyes off of Jesus and now they're focusing on just the works that they're doing rather than on him. In fact, they're really giving in to a form of idolatry. In speaking of Israel, some, one pastor said the nation had drifted so far apart from God that those who handled the law did not know him. It's a very serious state of affairs. The very people who should know God and accurately represent him no longer know him. How did Jesus say it? In Matthew 7, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, this is Jesus speaking, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. If Jesus never knew them, then they could not have truly known him. Yet they're actively ministering in his name, attributing their activities to his character. The disturbing realities that is possible to think one is actively serving God without a true relationship with him. Even in the case where we begin following after him, time and circumstances often turn our hearts aside. You remember Solomon? Why is this man that lived? Prayed to God, had the opportunity to build the temple. And, and he's the one who wrote the Proverbs. I mean, he, he prayed instead of for wealth or anything, he said, just, just help me to be wise to do your will. He became pretty foolish by the end, didn't he? His wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was well the heart of his father David, 1 Kings 11.4. Our commitment isn't about doing stuff. Our commitment is about loving God. What, is, what does Jesus say? He says, remember, consider how far you have fallen. I'm reminded of the prodigal son. Luke 15, Jesus says, is telling the story, he's telling three stories, if you remember in Luke 15, lost coin, lost sheep, and lost son. And the lost son has asked for his wealth from dad, and dad gave it to him. He's gone to another country, he's spent it all, he's now hungry, feeding pigs, and wishing for the food that belongs to pigs. For a Jew, by the way, this is really bad, Okay. Pigs, swine are really, really unclean. And if you are feeding pigs, you are even worse condition. And now you want to eat the food that pigs eat, which is what makes them unclean, and you're in big, big trouble. And you can't eat it because it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the pigs and the pig owner. And here in this faraway place, he finally breaks down and says, Oh, my. 
life was so much better back at dad's house. And what does he have to do? He can't just sit there and say, oh my, how, how bad it is and how much better it was. He's got to repent. And that's, that's the, and you, if you see it, there's an outline here that, that for us. There's three things that we have to do. You got to remember how far you've fallen. You got to repent and then do the things you did at first. But let's back up to remember. Do you know why God set up all the different celebrations and sacrifices, the festivals and all those things? It was to help the people to remember what God had done for them. And every time that they would remember, what do you do at an anniversary? Wedding couples, wedding anniversary, what do you do? Hopefully you celebrate. Hopefully you don't pout. Hopefully you don't get upset. Hopefully you're not ticked off. Hopefully it turns into something special. Maybe you've given him or her a card. You've perhaps written a note. But you're especially saying, I love you. You're special to me. Did you? You did do something, didn't you? Oh, okay. <laughs> Anniversaries celebrations, the various events, the various worship times of the church uh, of, uh, for Israel were all meant to remind the people, look at the things that God has done for us. Now let's celebrate those things and let it draw us back into a deeper relationship with him. Isn't that what communion's for? Communion is our Christian celebration where we, re we remember what Jesus did and it should break us down. It should humble us. It should move us to say, okay, I can't walk up there today without thinking about have I sinned or not. I mean, if I come up here today to take bread and the cup and I'm like, you know, <laughs> glad I'm not like the rest of you out there. I'm kind of in trouble, aren't I? <laughs> And so communion is that celebration, that reminder for us of what God has done for us. But I need to remind you of something that happened to um, Israel. Israel, well, if you've uh, read, read Hosea, you've read a pretty serious description in which God is saying, you know, Israel, you're my gomer, you're my prostitute. You've prostituted yourself and you've taken on all kinds of other affairs and, and now Hosea goes and he actually will buy Gomer back. He, she's up there on the slave block. She's already been used a whole bunch sexually and all. She's been a prostitute and everything and she's now up there on the slave block and, and, and she's being sold again and what is Hosea told to do? Go buy her off the slave block. Go redeem her. Go pay the price of her slavery. And, and, and he says, why? Because Gomer is like Israel. You've committed adultery, Israel. Jeremiah said this way, the word of the Lord came to me, chapter 2. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, this is what the Lord does. I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord. The first fruits of his harvest, all who devoured her were held guilty and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, you descendants of Jacob, all you clans of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives. He's reminding them, look at all the things that God has done for us. They didn't even think about that. I brought you into a fertile land to fruit and rich produce, but you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal following worthless idols. Therefore, I bring charges against you, declares the Lord, and I will bring charges against your children's children. I ask uh, couples when they're getting married three questions, or actually several, but th th a couple of the ones that, the, that I start with. Uh, what are the three things that you both enjoy doing together? Three things that you both enjoy doing together. The second thing I ask is, what three strong points attract you to each other? I have a little concern if I'm marrying a couple now. Well, I'm not attracted to him. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah, I think he's dumb and ugly. 
Okay, I think this one's going to really go well. <laughs> what do you enjoy doing together? I even have a little concern when they say, well, we enjoy watching movies together. You wouldn't know how many couples say that. We enjoy watching movies together. That's nice. But have you ever noticed how you will go to, and you watch a movie together? You watch a movie together like this. Yeah, movie, uh-huh. Popcorn, yeah, and we're sitting there and we're watching. And what are we doing together? <laughs> Sometimes you're sitting there falling asleep because it got boring or whatever. You're just worn out, right? <laughs> that, that happens to us, doesn't it, Virgil? <laughs> <laughs> it did one day, huh? <laughs> That's why girls do this. <laughs> but take note. Watching a movie may be nice, and, and, and if you dialogue about it, if you talk about that, if you share about it, okay, it can become a group experience. But too often, it's not a group experience. You're sitting there next to that person, and you're just watching the screen. So I get a little concerned if that's the main way that they enjoy being together. Now, I don't mind if they say, well, I like doing all the trips together. Okay, but again, you're, are you going to talk while you're on that trip? We've all known that people have ridden around in a car and not talked to one another, right? The cold treatment. <laughs> I'm just not going to talk to you. I'm going to make you feel the pain that you're sitting here next to me, right? I want to know that they've got some things that they've done together, that they've enjoyed I also want to know that there's things that they're attracted uh, in the other person. By the way, I've asked this question of couples who are about to break up because of an affair. And one of the things I want them to do is I, I'll then, uh, tell me about your wedding. One of the questions I ask on my questionnaire is, you know, tell me how you got engaged. How'd you meet one another? Well, I'll do this, and I've done this with uh, couples. In fact, I got this from a book called Love Life, which was trying to help couples come back together who had an affair. And what, do you, what, is, what does this author say? He says, look, you've got to get back to wh where you were back at the beginning. Remember when you first dated? I know he's gained on a few pounds. You, you, you look different too, okay? But, but remember what it was like when you first dated. And I want them to get back there. And I'm telling you folks that if there is going to be healing after an affair, it's going to take getting back to where you were before you got married. Going back and remembering. Thinking about the special times you had together. My first date with Debbie, we went to a homecoming dinner, and, and after the dinner, we drove up and towards Mount Baldy. And I still remember her um, um, needing to hurry up and go to the bathroom, so we rushed back down the mountain from, <laughs> from Mount da Baldy. I also remember that she was feeling sorry for the ASB president who didn't have a date for homecoming, so she canceled going to family camp with her family and went out to the homecoming dinner with the ASB president who was desperate for a date. <laughs> I didn't hear what you said, and that's okay. <laughs> but I also remember, I, I remember her going to concerts that, that I was doing with uh, the singing group from, from the school. I, I, I remember us, one of the things that we still like, um, and they still have them, but they've changed over the time, but get breakfast jack, onion rings, and a chocolate fr shake from Jack in the Box at midnight. Breakfast Jack, onion rings, and a chocolate shake. They really go well together. <laughs> uh, or maybe it was the, the times that we got Gouya cheese, G-O-U-D-A cheese, chicken in the basket crackers, and you just go out and, and eat those together, maybe out in a park or up in the mountain, wherever. I, w there were special things like that, the goofy things, right? The not expensive things even but things that we did that we enjoyed doing together. And, and here's what Jesus is saying, that when you've lost your first love, when you've forsaken the one that really matters to you, you need to go back and do the things you did at first. It takes repentance. It takes admitting that you're at a bad place. And it takes a change of direction. By the way, repentance is not just, oh, no, I feel bad. Repentance is, I feel bad, and I'm going to do something about it. I am going to change my ways. Not just, I feel bad, oh boy, 
for me. But no, I feel bad, Lord, and I need to change what I have been doing. That's repentance. Do the things you did at first, Jesus said. The early church was known for its love for one another. In fact, it was the early church, and one of the reasons why the early church really exploded was because of what they did for the poor. Sickness would break out in a community, and you know what they did with the sick back in that day? You put them out on the street and you let them die because you didn't want to get sick, especially when there was a plague. You know what the Christians did? The Christians went out on the street and took the sick and the poor into their homes. Yeah, some of them died in the process. They got sick too. But many got well that they helped. And look at the difference it made in a community that saw, wow, the Christians, the Christians love people. And Jesus is saying to Ephesus, don't just do things, but do things because you have a relationship with me. Go back and love the world because you love me. Do you love Jesus? Guys, that's a little harder for us to say, isn't it? Sometimes it's tough for us to say, yeah, so we have to say it more funny, like, you know, I love you, man. <laughs> yeah, right? And, and for some of us, it's, it's hard to say that. I hope you're not like the guy who told his wife, you know, look, I, you know, they've been married for like 40 years, and, and, and he said, you know, I, I told you I loved you when I married you. <laughs> Nothing's changed. So, so I'll let you know when it does. <laughs> yeah, guys, we need to learn how to say I love you. But, but do you love Jesus? Do you love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength? With everything that is in you? Do you remember when you invited Jesus to live in your life? Really, we should say that more clearly. Do you remember when Jesus asked to come in? When he knocked at the door of your heart, standing outside there and said, you know, I want to become part of your life. I want to make a difference for your life. I want to give you joy. I want to give you love. I want to give you forgiveness. I want to give you healing. I want to be special for you. Do you remember when he asked you that? And you said, yeah. Yes, I want you in my life. Do you, do you remember how you felt when you did that? And, and, and if you did it, you felt something. Now, I'm not saying you have to be all emotional when you accept Jesus Christ, but I'm telling you, when you accept Jesus, you know it. Something takes place inside of your heart. Something changes. <laughs> maybe you soften. Maybe you melt. <laughs> you open up. Do you remember what it was like when you did that? When you said yes to Jesus? Are you doing the things that you used to do when you said yes to Jesus? One of the things that couples stop doing, if they've ever done it, is they stop praying together. Maybe they did that. I've known couples, they're doing devotionals and stuff like that and, and as they're going through the dating process and especially once they're getting engaged, you know, so we'll take them through some devotionals and have them read things together and then they get married and, well, you know, he's got a different time schedule than mine and, and we're, we're, we're really pretty busy and all and pretty soon you find that they've stopped doing it and worst of all, they've stopped praying together. One of the most important things you can do, one of the most intimate things you can do as a couple is to pray out loud together. And guys, you're going to think you're not good enough at it. And girls, you need to avoid the pressure and just let him know that his prayers matter to you. Do the things you did at first. Now, if when you started your relationship, you were a mean, nasty person, and they didn't, you weren't very nice to that other, don't do the things you did at first. <laughs> Start something new and different. <laughs> Verse John, chapter 4. There are some incredible instructions from from the Lord. First off in chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, it talks about that God is the source of love. 
In fact, 1 John 3, 18 says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Your love needs to be from your heart. God shows us what genuine love is about. He commands us in in verse 11 to love one another. You remember what Jesus said? A new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's God's love that gives us confidence to go before the Lord. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. God loved us and so we should love others. Our love, our love is a response to God's love. When we love each other, we are actually responding to God's love. Grace Stedman said it this way, love is not just a word to write on a plaque and put on your wall. Love is what you do to people that irritate you. Love is what you do when you are upset and angry and hostile and feel like striking back. You start with God. You remember his love to you. Remember his forgiving spirit, how he wipes out everything without requiring anything from you. Respond to it and immediately pass it on to the one you are involved with. Love toward God is the most important thing in our life. Jesus is right when he says loving God is top priority. Everything else will flow from that love. But if you put anything else first, the whole process will soon run dry. Do you love one another? If you don't love, it is evidence that you don't know God. If you don't love, it's evidence that you don't know God. John Piper summed it up this way. If you don't love your visible brother, then you can't be loving the invisible God. And C.S. Lewis has a warning in his uh, book called The Four Loves. There's eros, agape, phileos, um, phileo, excuse me. To love all is to be vulnerable. Have you ever loved and not gotten loved back? Have you ever loved your spouse and not gotten loved back? Has God ever loved you and not gotten loved back? To love all at all from C.S. Lewis is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. Incidentally, the studies have proven that dogs know when you love them and they can respond to it. It's proven now, scientific evidence. So if you, if you don't want your heart to be broken, don't love anyone, including an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. Incidentally, C.S. Lewis says, the only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. Do you love God? Do you love him like that first day that you understood that he died for you? Or do you need to admit that you've forsaken, you've actually left, you've actually turned away from your first love? Because Jesus says, please, repent. Feel bad about it. And change and start doing the things that you did when you first came to know that Jesus loves you. So I invite you to prepare for the table, to come and be reminded of his love, to come and say you love him again, to renew your commitment to him. By the way, if somebody could go let the children know if they want to come back to children's Thanks, Wade. Now I'm going to talk really fast to see if you can make it back. (laughs) 
I've watched too many marriages break up because they forgot their first love. I grew up in a home that that adultery became a significant part of the home life and along with that came anger and hatred and meanness. And it was a Christian home. Folks, we need to do something to help marriages stay strong. To recommit to one another. And again, I apologize to anyone who's single who's saying, okay, Bill, I'm not married, so it doesn't speak to me. Oh, yeah, it does. Because like those of us who are married, you are in a love relationship with God, or at least you have the opportunity for that. And we in our culture are allowing other things to get in the way of our relationship with the one who loves us so much he died on the cross for us. He paid a price. He sacrificed himself. Do we need to repent? Take note. The Ephesian church was working hard. They were serving. And Jesus says, but I have this against you. You don't love me. You can do a lot for God and do nothing at the same time. You can be working real hard, but not loving Jesus. Oh, yeah, you might be putting out lots of energy, but not doing any of it because Jesus and you love each other. And so I counsel you, repent and do the things that you did when you first came to know Jesus. Let's pray. It all begins here, doesn't it, God? Do we really love you? Uh, Your word's very clear. You love us so much that you sent your son to die for us. Your love is unconditional. You've, You've given it without regard to our response or our behavior. You love us even when we continue to reject you. You love us when... When we're going through the motions, when, when our relationship's not right, when, when we're really kind of just ignoring you, you continue to love. And for that, God, we are moved and amazed, and we thank you. And today, God, may we repent if we have fought, forsaken, fallen out of, turned away from, consciously moved away from that love relationship with you. And as we come to the table today, Lord, oh, Lord, I pray that we would come and renew our commitment to you, Jesus, only you. And, Lord, if there's anyone here today who's never said yes to you, and maybe they've even gone to church for a long time, but but never had that personal relationship, doesn't understand what it means that they've fallen out of love with you, they've forsaken love because they've never really had it. Lord, I pray that in this moment right now that they would even come to the table today to say, thank you, Jesus, for your love. I accept that love, and I want to live my life for you now. Let this be the first day. Let them, let them experience that love like they never have, God. In Jesus' name, amen.